Hong Kong. I had the benefit of having a very good chat with the commissioner on things of common concern. Certainly, we cover topics not just in Hong Kong, but also in this part of the world, China, and also the global effort in fighting climate change. All these are things that are very close to our heart, although Hong Kong is just a tiny city in, in this part of the Pacific. But I believe the audience today would have a much stronger interest, not just on Hong Kong's fight against climate change, but also on how we gather our momentum in this important subject. So, um, Commissioner, I understand that this morning you have had a very uh, important discussion with a renowned congregation of representatives from the consumer groups on uh, how to empower consumers in a green economy. I believe that the session this afternoon would be equally, if not more important piece in our global climate action. The continued dialogue between Europe and Hong Kong, and indeed between different parts of the global community, be it among nations, regions, or cities, is essential to the fight against climate change. And I say this because climate change is a global issue. It knows no boundary. As an international financial center, Hong Kong prides ourselves for the strong mainland and international connections and outlook in many aspects of our city's economic development. And in the same token, there is no exception to our efforts in the areas of environmental protection and climate change. Indeed, as a member of APEC, we adopt the Sydney Declaration right after the signatories in 2007. We are also an active participants in a new movement, the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, where we have recently joined as steering group members at the invitation of the new chairman. In addition to hosting the C40 conference in Hong Kong last year, we'll be joining the C40 uh, conference in Sao Paulo uh, later this month. So underpinning our active power engagement is in fact a commitment and belief locally that Hong Kong as a responsible global citizen, should also play a humble part in combating climate change. Now, due to the surface-oriented uh, nature of the economy, and thanks to the very compact city layout, the per capita greenhouse gas emission of Hong Kong stands at about six tons per capita, which put us slightly below the world average of seven tons, but there's no ground for complacency, as we believe that Hong Kong positioned ourselves as a global city we believe a greater prosperity would also call for a greater responsibility. <laughs> so, in our fight against climate change, setting a target is vital. We have recently proposed to set ourselves the target of bringing down our carbon intensity by 50 to 60 percent by the year 2020. This target matches well and in fact surpasses the 40 to 45 percent carbon intensity reduction pledged by our central government in late 2009. Actually, it was in Copenhagen. Now, the adoption of such a progressive target not only demonstrates Hong Kong's commitment to become a low-carbon city, it also reinforces our country's determination to face up to the challenge of combating climate change. But to a layman, what does it mean by sort of a, agreeing to a target of 50 to 60 percent reduction in carbon intensity? Now, in the actual terms, it means an absolute reduction of greenhouse gas emission by 19 to 33 percent. That means we will be knocking off one fifth to one third of our total carbon emission in 10 years' time. And that's by no means a small target. In order to achieve that, of course, it needs a multiple uh, package of measures, ranging from energy mix to energy efficiency. But first and foremost, it is high time for Hong Kong to think about how our fuel mix should look like in the years to come. For the very reason that two-thirds of our carbon emission actually comes from the energy sector. So cleaning up the energy sector is therefore of paramount importance. Now, a host of measures have been taken by government to control greenhouse emission from this sector. For example, since 1997, we have in fact banned the construction of coal-fired generation units. We have also started on a gradual basis shifting to a higher proportion of natural gas for local electricity generation. Of course, looking ahead, promoting renewable energy is another key area in our clean energy strategy. 
Our geographical constraints have put a limit to our potential for solar and wind power energy, while hydro power seems to be off the map. But Hong Kong will stay tuned to all the uh, development, particularly on the technological side in this area, not just in Hong Kong, but also in our neighboring region. Not many people recognize that uh, Hong Kong actually provides financial incentives for our power company to engage the use of more renewable energy. And actually, there are already some PV panels set up for generating electricity for connection to our power grid. Now, the local company uh, in the power sector are also sort of uh, considering offshore wind farm projects. Now, our re renewable energy does not confine to wind or solar. There is, in fact, other scope for us to explore in the waste to energy sector. Now, Hong Kong is one of the few, very few places where majority of our waste are being landfilled. Actually, today, one of the three landfills in Hong Kong are using the landfill gas to produce town gas, and they are planning to expand this, which will reduce a carbon emission of, a, of about 130,000 tons per year. Now, looking ahead, uh, we also believe that the development of organic waste facility sludge treatment facility and the lately produced, uh, pr proposed integrated waste, waste management facility will also be good opportunity for waste to energy initiatives. Now the proposed integrated waste management facility, IWML, with a daily capacity of handling 3,000 tons of municipal waste, will be able to recover energy from the waste to generate electricity sufficient for 100,000 households achieving a reduction of about half a million tons of carbon emission each year. So these are efforts in the energy sector. We're also proposing a new, fix, uh, a new fuel mix formula, increasing the supply of nuclear from the, currently, from the current level of 23% to 50%. But of course, things happened in Fukushima recently would put a new light on how we should be going about the increase in nuclear energy. And clearly, a safer use of nuclear energy is being called for. But I should say that, well, that shouldn't deter the search for greener and cleaner fuel mix to replace the fossil fuel dominant power generation in Hong Kong. Now, other than the fuel mix, I think the biggest consensus within this community is a better use of our energy. And energy efficiency is, in fact, a key component to our strategy. Now, to further reduce emissions from this energy sector, actions have been taken to improve energy efficiency, in particular in built environment and electrical appliances. We are happy to see a new piece of legislation recently passed in November last year to mandate the implementation of building energy costs at new buildings as well as retrofitting existing buildings. Now, this will eventually avoid a total emission of 2 million tons of greenhouse gas emission in the coming 10 years. And that would be just the start. As we continue to tighten this requirement, we believe there could be scope for further reduction of carbon footprint from buildings. Now, given the fact that 90% of our energy are consumed in buildings, a clear target would be to green our building by cutting the energy use. But the, to incentivize the public to join us on this fund, we have launched a $450 million building energy efficiency funding scheme, whereby we provide dollar-for-dollar -dollar subsidy for energy com carbon audits and energy efficiency projects conducted in communal areas of residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. So far, the scheme has received very encouraging um, response, and over 8,000 buildings, which represent one-fifth of the total building stock, have come forward with this funding scheme, and we will be seeing buildings moving on to a more uh, conscious and wise use of energy. We are also conscious in greening our transportation system. Now, Hong Kong has, been, has a, an efficient public transport system with low rates of car ownership. In fact, over 90% of daily passenger trips are made by public transport. Our private car ownership rate is by far the lowest among the developed economy. Notwithstanding that, the transportation sector still constitute 18% of the carbon emission. So there is efforts to further reduce this by adopting a green transport strategy. 
you might have heard the government has recently set up its 300 million pilot green transport fund, which aims to encourage the transport sector to test out green and innovative transport technology, with a view to improving our air quality on the one hand and reducing our carbon footprint on the other. The, the fund has started to invite application a month ago. Valid application could include a new vehicle type, for instance, electric vehicles, equipments or machinery related to the transport activities. The subsidy will cover part of the product's cost, including installation, if applicable. But one of the subjects close to the heart of this administration is the promotion of wider use of electric vehicles. We have been collaborating with different EV manufacturers to conduct trials on EVs and introduce their EVs to Hong Kong. In the past two years, we have already rolled out a series of measures, including the total exemption of tax for car users to buy EVs and expanding the EV charging infrastructure. And in order to set a good example, the government has also made a point in the recent budget that EV, when replacing cars for the government fleet, will be expected to have another intake of 200 EVs uh, coming into the government fleet in the coming two years. Looking into the future, there are also going to be exciting development in both the West and East Kowloon areas. For the former, it has recently been decided that the city park designed by Foster and Partners is the preferred option for development of this future arts and culture hub. The area will be transformed into a magnificent park with a continuous waterfront, iconic cultural venues, colonnade avenues, tree-lined streets, and, in, and also green spaces offering tranquility. All these places and spaces are to be supported by a network of surface roads below ground to facilitate easy walking and a, and a public transport safe uh, system above. That the whole sector, the whole area, will strive to become carbon neutral. For the older airport site at Kai Tak in East Kowloon, the government is building a district cooling system in the new development area. It is going to be a very energy efficient system which consumes 35% less electricity as compared with the traditional system. We're also exploring the possibility to make it a low carbon zone which allows only zero carbon emission transportation modes. As the same model adopted in East and West Kowloon are likely to be repeated in other new development areas. Now the examples I have just talked about are illustrative of the spectrum of measures that are being carried out to start to build a new low carbon city. Certainly, we have to build on and enhance our existing efforts to further reduce Hong Kong's carbon footprint. In last year's consultation document about Hong Kong's climate change strategy and action agenda, it encompasses four major areas which I have mentioned, including maximizing energy efficiency, greening road transport system, turning waste to energy, and revamping fuel mix for our local electricity generation. Now, these does not only require government funding, legislation, and policies, but also private sector involvement, as well as collective behavioral changes at household, company, or even at individual levels. Climate change does pose an unprecedented and significant challenge for all of us. It is crucial for Hong Kong, and together with our nation and our nearby regions, and the rest of the global community, to sustain future development by pursuing a low carbon pathway. And low carbon is no longer just an environmental policy as it cuts across many other policy areas. And as I mentioned in the outset, climate change knows no boundary. Our effort to combat climate change must be done in full collaboration with our neighboring region, in particular Guangdong and the Pearl River Delta area, and also together with our nation. We are glad to see a common mission established with Guangdong to build a green Pearl River Delta area with a cluster of livable city, which also uh, supports the concept of a sustainable growth in this part of the region. This very concept is not only part of Guangdong's development strategy, but also enshrined in the recently released Trail 5 Year Plan. And we have seen actual collaboration, particularly on energy and also on the environmental side for the two places to work together. So we believe this will set a very good platform for Hong Kong to continue to be a green city and also hopefully a model for a greener region. It is our strong belief that every step we take 
is a building block for a greener environment, a greener Hong Kong and a greener world. And with those remarks, welcome again the Commissioner and also uh, I wish this uh, seminar a bigger success. Thank you.